at the beginning of this year, it was on our hearts for Uncommon Good to be a force of unity and harmony and bringing together opposing sides into one. And we believe that this is God's heart. In fact, uh, Charles may get into that tonight. It's in the preface um, too, about if you're connected with God's heart, I think you're going to be connected with a, a drive for unity in this world. So thank you all for being in this tonight. And really tonight is going to be just about getting to know the author who we are blessed to know. We heard Charles in a seminar with our denomination. Some of you may not even know that we're part of a denomination, but we're part of Missionary Church USA. That's where my ordination is. We are blessed to be in a partnership with Charles, a fellow ordained pastor with Missionary Church. We're just happy, happy for this moment tonight. So, so Charles, mm. welcome. Tell us a little bit about just where are you right now geographically and mm -hmm. something interesting about where you grew up and welcome. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just a, a little bit about me. Hey, and welcome. And as folks chime in or jump in, just want y'all to know you're very welcome. And Ryan, thank you. Uh, just for your warm introduction, Dawn, Cody, glad to see y'all. And uh, for each of you, a little bit about me. Uh, my wife and I, uh, wife of this June will be 25 years, Norlin, and uh, we have four kids, uh, Charles, Joe, Layla, and John. We like to call them Skippy. And uh, we, we live in uh, Santa Clarita. Right now I'm in Valverde. And uh, yeah, but I grew up in New Jersey. Uh, as I shared on the previous video, um, I'm a Jersey guy and uh, grew up in the 70s. And just a little bit about me, my parents both served in ministry. My father was a pastor in the Baptist and the Methodist church. Yeah, I, I got to see them walk with Jesus in uh, an environment that was becoming increasingly rough. Um, as putting it lightly, uh, we lived across the street from housing projects, which were kind of an experiment of its own. That's a whole other discussion. So I kind of got to see between the 70s to the 80s, my, my neighborhood becoming increasingly dangerous. But at the same time, I got to see the love of Jesus Christ through my parents, through the community that, that I lived in, through people in the church, and also seeing God at work across different ethnic groups and, and seeing that it was not confined to just the black church I was in, but I saw the love of God on um, my um, high school track coach, uh, Coach Ward, who, you know, when our little school didn't have a bus to take us all to cross country meets, he put us all in his car and drive us back and forth till he got all of his team there. I got to see it in uh, Mrs. Sepulveda, who uh, was, um, didn't speak much English, but loved the Lord and would show us the love of God and would correct us in the neighborhood when we were acting up, got to see it in my professors. And so all that to say is that's where I'm from. I received Christ in college at Lincoln University. And this thing of unity has always kind of been there. And even in my wilder days, I just couldn't resist the idea that, wait a minute, God's at work among all peoples. And even though you might hear extremes on the right and the left, Christ is the way. And, and so um, just kept coming back to this thing of unity and uh, my parents and Dr. King really had dedicated it to, um, to them and what they mean and what have their example to me. And there's a lot I could share about that maybe later, so. That's a great, that's a, that's a great introduction. And, and uh, I wanna remind everyone tonight, like as we, as we Zoom, be interactive. Don't hesitate to ask questions. Don't hesitate to go off topic. Really, yeah. tonight, um, there is no other topic than to get to know Charles, um, to hear about his heart, and to have God show us the man behind the book before we dive in. So uh, that is tonight's, uh, tonight's purpose and everything. And, and Charles, I, I feel like um, we... For those of you who know, we did we we had the joy of doing a podcast with Charles just right at the beginning of the year, and it was so so great to have that time with you, Charles. And Same um, here, brother. the purpose, the reason why we wanted to start it off with you is that there there is still a problem. If any of you guys have seen the news, maybe in the last year or two oh. or five or ten or fifty, um, 
there is still a problem with racism in America and in the world. Um, but focusing in the US, um, there is still a problem with equality and justice. And we wanted to be a part of not only that conversation, but be a catalyst of, of creating more unity. And that's how we came across Charles. And, and I remember in that podcast, Charles, um, and I hope this isn't like diving in too deep too fast, but You'll it was for interesting it. hearing how, though you wrote this book about biblical response to what divides us, you yourself revealed that, that wow, there were, there were times in your life that you felt you had racism in your heart. Sure. Um, and I think many, many of the people on this side of the screen would go, oh, he's the expert. He, he's never dealt with any of this or seen that in his family or in his life or harbored that in his heart. So can you tell us a little bit about that heart journey with you? Yeah, and, and, and I appreciate you, you asking that and, and just give everyone else a chance to, to share. Feel free to ask questions, be comfortable. I think part of my journey was um, growing up in the church and, and as, and I don't know who's all in the audience, one of the things the Bible talks about is being a sinner. And so in my sin, I started looking at things in other people in the church. I started looking at sin and other people in society. And from a place of self-righteousness, I began to judge like, well, why is our neighborhood getting like this? And why, are, why can't I go over here and not over there? And in real lived events of injustice that were coming at me, my heart response was to hate back, you know, um, being 15 or 13 walking around a supermarket and I'm like, why is this guy following me? I got money in my pocket and being put out of a, a, a store in my hometown just cause of this. And then hearing the stories of my parents coming up. So hate began to rise in my heart and around, and I'm still a church kid. I'm hearing the Bible and hearing all that, but I'm also drifting towards other voices that are like radical. Like, you know what? You don't deserve that. You're an educated black man. You ought not. And so there'd be truth, but there would also be a sense of acrimony and your life would be better if it wasn't for all of them, mm. you know? But what do you do when you have hate rising in your heart towards just say Irish people and your track coach happens to be Irish and will give you his last dollar to make sure you got lunch because you forgot yours or piles us in. So somehow God would not let me get too far in that thinking, even though there were real events, you know, my father growing up in the South, the horrendous things they, they experienced. So, so my mind and my heart was in this turmoil, if you will. And I'm hearing Bible that's combating the lies of the evil one, if you will, not to sound too churchy, but it was a bit of a journey. And to be honest with you, when it rises up in the flesh, if I happen to be pulled over and I've been pulled over about nine times and, and it's almost like a drill, how I talk to the law enforcement officer will dictate how my encounter will go. Mm -hmm. And so, and so after those events, I have to pray. Okay, father, um, was that just, was it unjust? What do you think about it? And then have to deal with it in my heart, but speak the truth. If it is an injustice, speak the truth. And at the same time, not allow revenge or hate. And so the Lord was kind to always put a counter to it. And, and so after I received Christ, it just made sense like, oh, God is not limited to any one group of people. And here it is in the Bible. Why do we have such a problem with it in our country? Well, oh, because people are taking these wonderful words, which I've just dropped, <laughs> and twisting it to fit their own culture, whatever. And, and as you study it, that's the history of the world, right? Egypt did it towards the Jewish people. Babylon did it towards this group, that group, Germany. And so you have this rise and falls of empires. And, and, and you know, there's even things going on right now in, in different parts of the world where genocides are happening. And if you scratch the surface, it inevitably comes back to pride and hate. So part of my journey is a part of the larger journey. I'm just grateful the Lord kept me from it. Um, 
I just want to mention this. I don't want to put him on the spot. Art is a dear friend and a mentor to me. Uh, I love him. Art, you know, I love you, brother. And he experienced firsthand some of the things I talked about with police brutality. But that man loves Christ and loves y'all. I can say it like that. And, and I respect him greatly. So that's I, I, I'm here because of the grace of God. Without Christ, I, you know, I'd, we wouldn't be Zooming now. I'd be somewhere else trying to rally the troops. And, and that's where I think just to try to be humble about it, it's really a God thing, really, that we can experience God's love and be free enough to give it to anybody and not restricted to just, well, me and mine. And, and that's a sad place to be, to be honest with you. So that's, that's a little bit of something. <laughs> I have a All question. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry, Don. No, um, you go ahead. Okay. Um, my sister is a missionary in Africa. She's mm -hmm. currently in Sudan. Uh, um, okay. She's been there pretty much since she graduated high school. But anywho, um, but I notice a disparage, and I'm curious what you think about it as far as, especially the youth of the African American kiddos so is your question uh what's the difference between african-american youth and sudanese youth or is it a question of you know the culture of youth in america or black or, or how they view each other sure. just want to make sure i'm, I'm tracking sure. with your specific sure. question or is there a um, comparison or what would you say i guess i'm just confused as to why here the african-american youth are angry bitter you know I, I, I don't know. I guess I'm just wondering why the disparity, why the, why the difference? In your conversations, just one last question. When it comes to African-American youth, do you converse regularly with African-American teens outside of your family? Like how, just, just ballpark, yeah. how many would you um, say? You I know? used to, not, not, not recently but I used to. Okay. I have some thoughts on it and I see brother Art's got his hand there. Art, you, you want to share and then I'll jump in and I, and cause just one little thing before Art shares, whenever you describe people, it's always a can remember we're talking about large groups of people. And so um, I can know probably a hundred people from New Jersey, but I can't say authoritatively that everybody from Jersey you know, if you smack them, they're going to smack you back, that kind of thing. So just always try to remember there's always individuals that kind of break whatever experience you had. But I have okay. more to say on that. Art, Art you want to jump in there, brother? Uh, yeah, yes, I would. You know, I, I would just like to say that when I was in the military, I, tra I traveled abroad. And uh, I met uh, Africans uh, in, in, in uh, Europe. Uh, I met I've met different people, different nationalities uh, in my travels. And one of the things I want to say that, you know, in regards to the comment about the youth, I would say that that's an American issue. That's not an African-American issue. The sense of entitlement, uh, being spoiled and having taken uh, taken education and, and the, the rights. In fact, even not you go even out of the youth and say, even with the adults, we take our rights for granted. You know, being abroad where you don't have the rights, where they tell you uh, you're guilty until you're proven innocent, that that's that's not in Germany. You don't get that. And and you know what? You're right. People from Africa, but people from Mexico and people from all over take advantage of opportunities that we squander. You know that mm -hmm. we squander here. So. It's more of an American uh, attitude, an American issue than it than just an an African American issue, you know. And uh, you, you know, but one thing I would say with rappers and the youth out of our communities, you do hear more anger, you do hear more. Uh, not it's not really entitlement. I would say it's more anger, and it's more. Uh, uh, and one of the things I like about Charles' book, he comes from the perspective of a biblical, uh, a biblical uh, reconciliation, reconciling between the two, and and uh, not coming from a place of anger. And I think that's where uh, uh, where we go wrong a lot. 
on both sides, on both sides. Anyway, that's thank you. Yep. Wow, Art, thank you. Um, you hit the nail on the head. Um, I just add a little bit, but there's a whole lot much more to, to add. I, first, I want to welcome Annette. Annette, thanks for joining in. Welcome Very grateful. Um, and uh, it, we're having a little conversation. So as you feel comfortable, feel free to share your thoughts. And I shared earlier the role you played in developing Undivided. And uh, just to respond, my own little experience, I had the privilege of serving with Relief and Development with Children's Hunger Fund. I met Sudanese pastors who were refugees from the fighting there. Um, I met brothers and sisters in Christ in Uganda, Rwanda, Zimbabwe, uh, Egypt, the Cote d'Ivoire. And I could say that Africa in general, just like America, is not monolithic. And so, so um, people tend to see, I'm not saying that it's you, Kelly, but people tend to think of Africa like one place, one state, like I'm going to Africa. And so certain mannerisms that might fly in Uganda could get me hurt, you know, in, you know, name a country. Right. Right. And so and so yeah. um, and at the same time, um, they have sin there, too. It just shows up differently. Um, when we read the scriptures, Romans 3, 23 says all men sin and fall short of the glory of God. And so as a follower of Christ, what are the young people facing today? And I agree with Art, not just young, but old. We're one of the wealthiest nations on the planet. I can get water. I can go to the restroom. I got lights on me and what does it do to, I'll speak for me. What does it do for me that I live in such comfort and ease day in, day out and people not too far from here don't. And, and so, and so that can warp my thinking and then add on top of it, some of the issues that aren't raised. But the good news is, is, you know, Jesus says, if you love your life, you'll lose it. If you lose it for my sake, you'll find it. Sometimes less is more. Mm -hmm. Our young people um, gravitate towards certain aspects of the subculture because sometimes they feel hopeless. Mm -hmm. And and we could say grown-ups with not just drugs, but the opioid epidemic. We're seeing it going across rich and poor alike. I work in psych. Mm -hmm. I can have a room where there's a guy that's a millionaire, plastic surgeon in one room, mm -hmm. another guy that's off the block who may have been on the streets and they're in the same room, but they they don't have hope. And so in some ways, issues of racism kind of gets us foggy and kind of pointing at others where the real thing is that people are alienated from God and therefore they're gonna be alienated from other people. And my mom says this, she said, Charles, it's a hard issue, son. Somebody who's racist, they got something going on here. If you're not right here, how in the world am I going to be right with you? You know, and that's why Coach Ward and people who I grew up with, Mr. Parker, who's my dad's co-worker, they can love me and treat me like a son. And it's it's no big thing, my black skin to them, because they're like, oh, that's Junior, that's Charles's son. And in the same way, if you're a follower of Christ, uh, I like what Don, Don said on our last time. We don't have to always look at the larger, how do I treat young people? How do I treat my neighbor that I may disagree with? Do I show respect? How do I treat my coworker? How do I kind of bring it down, you know, cause it's easy for me to kind of point to that larger group, but man, how you doing Charles? <laughs> you know? and, 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 and by God's grace, hopefully we on this line can be those kind of people in your community, in your church, that, you know, if there's one person I can go to, it's going to be her or him, or I'll talk to Kelly because she prays for me, because our young people are struggling. So, sorry, preacher's embellishment went kind of long there. No, thank you. Thank you for your answer. Thank you, Art. Humbling. I get it. And feel free to join in. We're just kind of chopping it up here. As you mentioned, anger and having one bit of a temper myself that the Lord deals with. Anger does play a, a part in the issue of racism. We won't find the word specifically racism in the Bible, but just like a pound cake has ingredients, pride is in there, anger is in there, fear is in there, hate is in there, uh, ignorance is in there, mm -hmm. and 
you will find the word partiality. And so um, before I used to go to Africa, I had certain ideas about what Africa was like. And I went there and had my mind blown. There's some really beautiful places. Here's a funny story. I was in West Africa and I was walking with our host and we we're having a good time and kids were out of school. And there are all these school kids between maybe 10 and 13, and they're all carrying machetes. And I'm walking down the street, the road, and there's like 15, 20 kids that are walking from school, and they all are carrying, they call them cutlasses in West Africa. And I looked to, I'm like, well, what's, what's going on here? And he just, you know, my host didn't, he wasn't worried about us. Like, you know, we don't usually see young people carrying machetes. He said, oh, they, they have cutlasses. I was like, well, what are you using cutlasses? Well, all, the way our schools are set up, some kids go to the school in the morning and then they go work in the fields immediately after. I said, really? He said, yeah, they're just carrying their farming implements because they're going to go help their parents. And I said to myself, would you see the average middle school kids in America walking down the street of any color with machetes? How would that go? And that was like my mind got pulled out of my brain and just kicked. So my concept of, of you know, seeing Africa as all a war zone and everybody's poor, there is wealth in Africa and the people are that wealth. I've seen beautiful places had great Rwanda meals. Rwanda is gorgeous. It is. Rwanda oh. is beautiful. I've been there like another about San Diego. four times. It's just beautiful. Yes, it um, is. The, the Congo has a great deal of beauty, although it's been rife with war and there's a history mm -hmm. there with King Leopold, which yep. most people don't know about. Um, but I would say about 80, 90 percent of Africa is really beautiful. Um, but there's a depiction of that. And let's just say this. When we don't see people as being in the image of God, we can come up with our own picture in our minds of anybody. And when you don't know someone, it's easy to go with the picture, oh, oh, you know, all white folks are this, all black folks are this, all Spanish people are this, and you have all Asian people are this, and then don't let someone get up in front of you who, who will feed you that narrative not feed you with the tr truth of who Jesus is, you know, for God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. So we have two voices we can listen to. We're going to listen to what God says about who you are and the worth and dignity and value that everybody on this line has and all in this neighborhood and yours too. Or do we want to listen to the whispers of the evil one that hates us and wants us to hate each other, you know? Yep. So Charles and, and Art, and I think some of the, uh, the things that you um, responded to there reminded me of something I believe for a long time, but it's like one of those things that you relearn over and over and over again. And that um, proximity really makes it difficult to hold on to wide generalities. Wow, that's huge. But the problem with that is that not all of us have the ability or the, the, the freedom, the time, whatever you want to say, the, the, the literal proximity to be able to build friendships with people across all sorts of different um, life experiences that would really give us the breadth of knowledge that we need to begin some of this work that you're talking about. So what, I guess, like, what's a starting place, you mm -hmm. know? Wow, that's huge. Um, I, I have some thoughts on that, but I want to open up for more dialogue and, and definitely I don't want to monopolize it. Anyone have any thoughts on, on uh, this thing of proximity and how that helps heal those divides? Any thoughts? And I'll jump in in a moment. I had uh, I had a thought right away when uh, when that that topic came up, and that and that is just having an open mind, you know, just having an open mind and not uh, being locked in to one scenario, you know, and uh, being able to uh, being able to uh, adapt 
uh, with, you know, with the reality as it presents itself. That's good. Openness. Any, any other thoughts? Anybody? Well, well, here's a thought, and just to add to it, uh, openness, um, having that insight, like how how have I been shaped by people around me? And our Lord Jesus talked about taking the plank out of our own eye. We can see the speck in, in each other's. There's people who I love who've raised me, but sometimes they may have taught me something that's wrong, you know, and, and it's, it's hard to, well, Grandma loves me. She wouldn't tell me anything wrong. But if she said something, I'm not saying my grandmother did or yours, but if she said something that was wrong about groups of people, then I have to say, well, how does this line up with the word? And am I letting this shape my thoughts and worldview? So having that insight and also being open. The other is uh, two things, um, taking opportunities like this, starting where you're at uh, with the relationships or possible relationships you have. Um, one other thing is reading broadly, um, good things, um, things that stretch you. Um, I, you the, there's uh, the writings of St. Patrick. Most of us think of St. Patrick's Day. A lot of folks don't know that he was a missionary. He was actually a slave at one time, and he was taken from his homeland, from Britain, and he, he was brought to Ireland. And while he was a slave there, he developed a heart and a compassion for the people there. And that's kind of wild. And so as I'm reading Patrick's life, and you can read it for free, um, you know, God calls him to be a, a, a missionary to the people that once were his captors. Now that's kind of radical when you think about it, but the advancement of the name of Jesus in a loving way came through Patrick. And so when I read that, when I look at, well, how did God transform the heart of this man from being wounded by an evil thing to being a champion of the Christian faith so that now we honor his name for that, that can speak to my own experience. You know, uh, when I read about Fermentius and Odysseus in the ancient church, two Turkish young men who are Christians who were kidnapped off the coast of Somalia and Sudan, interesting that you mention it, they were the ones that took the gospel message to uh, the court of King Izana. He was a child. And they also, under Athanasius, took the faith of Christ to the early kingdom of, of what we know as uh, Ethiopia and that area of Sudan. And so some of the earliest churches that were developed in East Africa came through these two Turkish young boys who would go on and share their faith there. So going back to what Dawn said, sometimes reading and hearing the actual words of people that are different from you and seeing God's work in them and also valuing that, oh, God, if he's at work in that person or that person, I mean, there's some, going back to what we talked about young people, I know we see a lot of rough things, but there's some outstanding young people out there, some wonderful young people out there. And we don't hear their stories sometimes, maybe because it's easier to highlight bad things in the media but sometimes reading about the work of God in, among other peoples can help at least open us up to when we do interact with people, we're a bit more open. Uh, I'm gonna swing it back to you, Ryan. Any, any other thoughts? I just have a question for you because I tend to be um, an eternal optimist. And, you know, looking over the course of my lifetime, this previous summer, accepted and, and certain events that have happened, um, you know, in current events, it seems like I'm seeing a trending away from racism and not, not toward it. Um, you know, I, I think back to some of the sitcoms that we used to just watch and think nothing of, like All in the Family and that sort of thing, and the language and the, and the, the things that, that came up in those that now, I heard that they did a, you know, like a screening of it for millennials and they were just absolutely shocked at what was in those things that I grew up on just watching. So I feel like I'm seeing a trend, you know, we've had an African-American president, there's, there's a lot of positive. So I just want to get your perspective on, on that side of it. Oh, that's a good question. 
And um, I'll just share my thoughts in, in this is not gospel, but this is just my perspective. I think you have yes and no. Uh, we do have some really positive things happening. I asked my mother something like this. She's 80, oh, excuse me, I won't say her name, or, or age rather. But uh, but uh, mom, if you're watching, please, please don't get mad. Um, but she participated in the civil rights movement. She was a part of SNCC. And one thing that she did say that was encouraging to her was the young people, and we're not talking about rioting and people breaking things, but folks, black and white and red and yet all different colors, the young people in protests of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, and many others, the peaceful protests, that was something that she didn't see in the 60s and the 50s when she participated in. So there's a sense that a lot of the, the, of the evil of racism culturally as Americans, this next generation may not wrestle with as much as you know, some of us that have a little bit more, more life on us, you know, and, and, and that shows up maybe in entertainment and things like that. And of course, the election of the president and also some would say even election of Kamala Harris. So you have those things. On the other hand, because we're talking really about sin, racism is a thing of sin. It's a hard issue. It, it, it doesn't quite go away. It's like, um, I won't use a bad example here, but but it's it's a residue that just wants to stick around, and and so um, many people uh, take umbrage at the fact that the country is becoming more multi-ethnic and more uh, pluralistic. And and please hear me, I'm not a universalist about you know worshiping a variety of deities. I have no disrespect to other faiths. I'm a Christian. I believe. Christ, you know. Um, that being said, the reaction to the, the more of a multi-ethnic America, there's some individuals that feel afraid. And in some instances where they hear voices that are radical on the far left, the reaction to that is what you saw with January 6th, which was horrible. Um, and it was nationalistic. Um, uh, and, and there was a question that someone asked, why do you suppose racism is so sticky, as you say? I think it's, it's, it's part of sin. Um, let's take the Apostle Peter uh, in Galatians 2. Peter, and I'm going to say this and then want to segue to Art. Peter was an apostle of God, but he was an ardent Jew. He loved, and, and you know, there's aspects of our culture that we can love and value because God certainly worked in it, you know, whether wherever you're from. But when that becomes an idol that you hold up, that people have to be that as opposed to being Jesus, and you exclude people based on that, that's why you might have, sadly, you know, events like January 6th, or you have individuals who may even be in political offices who will speak horrible things about different nations, different peoples. And it doesn't matter what color you are, you know, there's only one creator. And so that part won't go without kicking and screaming. And so, um, so yeah, it sticks around. It may be not as bad as when my mom was in school in the fifties, but it's still there. Art, you wanted to share Art? Uh, yes, yes, I did. Uh, I think that that, um, that particular statement goes to the core of your book and to the core of why we are all meeting tonight. And one of the things I like to say, I enjoy seeing the commercials with the interracial couples, the, uh, the interacting between different races. Uh, you know, there's a lot of that, like, as you say, uh, President Barack Obama being the first African-American president, and then we got the vice president. But on the other side, as Charles was saying, though, you see the um, you see the uh, those that have been in power fearing uh, fearing the uh, the uh, the races coming together and and uh, the populations uh, becoming mixed and stuff like that, and you and you see this uprising as a as a result of it. Uh, of, of electing a black president and a black vice president and and blacks becoming more involved in politics and stuff like that. 
uh, people fearing losing their their uh, their stronghold. And um, you know, one of the things I would say though is for me, one of the reasons I'm here tonight is that, and uh, supporting Charles is that I believe that those of us that are not afraid uh, to cross over racial lines and barriers that are invisible but but yet barriers uh would be uh strong in keeping the keeping the the gates of a communication and reaching across the aisles and being able to uh and being able to be civil with one another mm -hmm. you know and not not agreeing with everything that each other do but at least have everybody have the dignity or, or the respect of uh being able to be who they are you know Sure. And so I think that's very important, but not everybody, not everybody is willing to reach along, re reach out along um, across racial lines, you know, and uh, I'm not saying uh, some of them, uh, some of some people are, I, I'm not going to say that they, they are bad people or even that they're racist. Uh, but however, it's like I'm comfortable here and I don't want to be uh, ostracized. Uh, by, you know, I don't want the results of uh, myself. I grew up in uh, San Fernando and it was a melting pot. And so I was befriended by Hispanics. I was befriended, befriended by whites, uh, also by whites. And so I've had all these different friends and, and uh, through the years, I've kept it that way. And uh, well, I should say God, I, I would say God put that in my life, you know. But but the thing I'm trying to say, the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, it's easy to go one way or the other. It's like, well, since they don't want to communicate with me, let's I won't I won't I won't I won't communicate with them out of anger. And, and what Charles is talking about is uh, have a biblical uh, from a bib biblical perspective. And so uh, I do think that it's a it's a uh, very important to be able to keep the, the lines of communication open. And that level heads will prevail. Well I have said. a question that goes along with that. I, I know I'm going to sound like, oh my God, who is it? And she's like totally racist. It's um, okay. Can you explain the difference between January 6th response to the Black Lives Matter response? Because it seemed like all of a sudden it was, whoa, it's an insurrection and, you know, all that. But when People are with the Black Lives Matter burning down police precincts and 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 ruining businesses and people's homes and 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 shooting each other. That was peaceful protest. That's that's peaceful. You're not seeing anything. You know, it's peaceful. But the other one was an insurrection. Could you tell? Could you help me with that? Yeah, and, and Kelly, I appreciate those questions, and please keep them coming. Uh, I've thought about that a bit, and uh, we have a just a little side note. Uh, there's a group of ministers and pastors. We get together every other month and have conversations. Art is a part of that. Uh, Phil Graff, and they're actually grouping of black and white pastors. We eat, we pray for each other, we have a good time, and, and we talk, you know. Um, and this question came up, and one of the things uh, first and foremost, as, as followers of Christ, we want to honor him by how we treat each other, which includes, um, uh, um, well, how we respond to our enemies. And the Lord said, turn the other cheek. That's not an easy thing to do. He tells us to submit to those in authority. And he exemplified that uh, when he stood before uh, Pilot, and he stood. He, he said, "You know, my kingdom is not of this world. And if it were, my people would fight for me." Um, and going back to something that Dawn said earlier, you know, proximity, uh, and and also knowing uh, that there's individuals in everything. Um, uh, it's a long answer to a good question. When my parents or my mother participated in the civil rights movement in the '50s, '60s, you saw pictures of them with suits on. And, and dresses, there was a sense of dignity. And at that time, uh, the church was pretty much the main leading force behind much of the civil rights movement back in those days. Now, as things went on, there was a group that kind of got into it and started wanting to riot. And on several occasions, 
Martin Luther King himself said, if you're not about nonviolence, get out the line. If you're not about it, leave the group. And so, so you always have amidst legitimate protest, groups of people that take it as an opportunity to, to rob, to shoot, to act up. And, and, and I would imagine in on those situations, you, you have people that have an ulterior motive. Now to the question that you shared, Black Lives Matter, and they're their own organization, and I certainly uh, don't affirm the core grouping of it, but the statement is a true statement. As the image of God is on all people, including people who happen to be Black, they do matter. I know they matter to me, but if they didn't matter to me, they matter to God. Genesis tells us that. And so you had people that were protesting uh, the murder, the regular murder of unarmed Black men and women, which is its own history. Some of those people that got involved, <clears throat> uh, some took to rioting, and uh, and I certainly denounced that. And and they ought to go to jail. Um, some of those individuals were opportunists. That, in fact, if you look at some of the video, you'll see legitimate protesters actually, in some cases, yelling at folks, saying, "Hey, you're not here for us. You're gonna they're gonna blame us for this." Why are you here? You can actually see on regular occasions people that were like, well, now's my time to get paid. Um, but having said that, what you don't see in the BLM protests, even the ones that went bad, you don't see the banner of Jesus waved. I just want to pause there. You don't see we're rioting and fighting for our rights under the banner of Jesus with the BLM movement. Now I wanna to turn to January 6th. Everyone that names Jesus on this call or who's zooming in, the horrible thing of January 6th is that the, the fair good name of Jesus Christ was drugged down. And in any event, you know, I, I, I can, I go to places, I'll sit and talk to just about anybody, but when my king is brought up and he's characterized in the wrong way, I personally have a problem with that. I met, uh, uh, um, y'all bear with me, I met a, a, a sister to one of the uh, victims of the Jonestown massacre. And for those of you who don't know this, but there was a preacher by the name of Reverend Jim Jones. Who, he was in the Bay Area and he developed a following and he started off with Jesus doing all these good works. But then gradually it became a cult where the people began to give him so much praise and loyalty that they decided to leave America and have their own commune. And I'm going somewhere with this. I don't go too far afield from BLM in January 6, but they were so loyal to him that they did not hold him accountable for things that he did wrong. And then when a delegation was sent to investigate the conditions of the place, and there were stories of, of rape and crime, at, and, and he used manipulative tactics. This was a narcissistic guy, and that's a whole other discussion. He, he, he somehow wooed the people into following him and they went and committed mass suicide. The power of life and death is in the tongue. And so if we say and speak and say things that lead people to do violence, I mean, as a preacher, I'm held accountable for what comes out of here. So if you don't hear anything else, that is not the way of Jesus, whether it's rioting, during the BLM times or it, or the attempt to, I'll use their words, stop the quote unquote steal. Um, neither of those lines up with what Jesus calls us to do. And uh, read the scriptures. How did Jesus relate to political figures? What does the Bible show about how, the Bible is not very flattering about political leaders because whenever they get out from under the authority of God, God brings them down. That's what happened to Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 4. You know, he appoints authority and any authority that exalts itself 
and I'm not just beating up on Trump here, our president, we just put it out there, but any authority on any level gets out of line, then expect God's judgment. I know it's kind of heavy, but I'm just speaking from the heart here. Okay. Art, Art you had something to say, or Ryan, feel free. Oh, go Art first, and then I'll follow Art. That's awesome. Well, well Ryan, you haven't spoke. I, let me follow you. You haven't spoke yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks, Art. Well, I, I just I'm, I'm watching our I'm watching our time, and I want to be respectful of our time. And but I think one of the one of the most powerful things, and the reason why we're in this conversation tonight, is because God has laid upon Charles Hart um, a message for the world and anyone who reads his book that at the heart of the Bible, which is the reveal of God's heart, um, there is actually no excuse for the judgment of someone's heart and value based on the color of their skin. And the Bible makes such an incredible strong point about that from the very first chapter that we are without excuse as a kingdom of God to base judgment on, on that. Um, and sometimes uh, we miss that. And in fact, any of us who have read any bit of history have known that the church has been on the wrong side a lot of the times. And that was a, that was a steal of the gospel. That was a steal of the message of, of the church from the very beginning and a misunderstanding of, of scripture and theology that isn't reflective of God's heart. So what, I'm, what I love about this group and about the journey that we're all about to begin together as we go through your book, Charles, um, is I pray that what we experience from this is actually a deep connection and a reveal of God's heart for all of humanity. And um, how can we understand God's heart for creativity and diversity, but at the same time, equal value and love for every human we encounter? So that's what, that's kind of, that's where I'm excited about. And, uh, but Art, I don't want to miss what is on your heart that led to the raising of the hand. And then we'll, uh, then we'll wrap it up because, you know, Annette, you've been smiling, but you haven't said anything. Neither is Craig Morrison down there who's a teacher and gets to experience the, uh, the wide diversity of uh, kids in school, but maybe we'll hear from him another week. But you go, Art, now it's yours. You know, listen, I don't wanna take an opportunity from somebody else that haven't had a chance to say anything. I really, I really would like to have somebody else have an opportunity to speak, you know? So I, I will regress, I will digress. Oh, you're, no, no, no you're gentlemen. Right. Anyone else, because if no one else, then we, we wanna hear, yeah. we wanna hear yeah. what Art's heart. I just, I just wanted to say, um, I, I'm, I'm sorry that I, I had to uh, hop on late tonight, and I was just really blessed for Charles to invite me to this group, and his book, his book was just like a, an answer to my prayers. Um, this subject is really very, very uh, important to me, and really a huge um, burden, I feel, of the healing that we need to have take place in our country and of course our world as well. Um, I, I, I left a question for Charles just a minute ago, so maybe we can do it uh, at another time, but maybe I'll just put it out there for people to think about um, until the next time. But um, I, I have uh, children who are not following Christ and they see so many people who name themselves to be Christians that um, support um, political leaders who, who have shown themselves to be racist and support racism. And they just, they don't understand it, you know? And, and um, they, their hearts seem to me more tender than even people that I know that are believers about this subject. So I really don't know how to answer them about that. Um, let me uh, preface the answer with a scripture. It's in Peter. It says, uh, uh, it finds, we find favor, it find, and paraphrase, favor with God when we bear up under sorrows unjustly, for Christ has been our example. Uh, though he was reviled, he didn't revile in return, but he kept entrusting himself to the one who judges righteously. We've all been like sheep gone astray, and we've returned to the shepherd and guardian of our souls. Now, that's a long quote and I've kind of stumbled a bit but the apostle Peter wrote that to Christians who were um, suffering 
in the Roman Empire, but he also was encouraging them about a response to injustice, like real injustice. Like when you see, okay, this person is saying, I love God, I love people, but their words and their actions are not lining up and it's wrong. And whether they say they follow Christ or not, and maybe they do, but what's happening is wrong on a heart level. And I try to remember that verse is, is that at the end of the day, the favor of God, I want it to rest on me. I know you want it to rest on you and that and those of you, I can't fix that, but I'm going to trust God that you're going to fix it. And, and Peter encourages them that the example or the pattern for life is Christ. And that word, uh, uh, there's a word there, pattern, it's like a stencil. I remember not being able to draw, still can't draw. There's a stencil and pattern that you, you, you do the lines in and you color in. So our pattern is Jesus and how he may color that in in our lives with what we face with suffering. He can make the beautiful picture out of a difficult circumstance, even that this bringing us to himself as a shepherd as a part of that picture. You know, we return to the shepherd and guardian of our souls. Now back to the more direct question, what do you do when a Christian advocates for folks who say and do things that are unchristian or in this specifically that are, let's just say racist? We can stop at that moment and just recognize that there's something wrong there and go to God, God, there's something wrong. This is somebody I love. Um, I'm not saying you guys pastor this is my pastor who's taught me well but he has this thing about people from asia that's un, it's not of you and i brought it to his attention and the elders but he still kind of keeps harping on it or you know or my mom she says this about jewish people but she taught me scripture and she led me to christ that so we go to god and we pray and we still live and walk in the truth and bear witness to it but recognize that that issue of the heart really is between them and God. And I, I put Jonah in there for this reason. I wrote, and just a little bit of spoiler alert, Jonah is a story to the American church, okay? So don't tell anybody. <laughs> Actually, I do want, it's to the American church because we have had wonderful ministers of the gospel, men and women who have shared wonderful things with great theology, but our history towards peoples of different backgrounds and ethnicities, including my own, has been horrible. <laughs> and, and so kinism is an American version of a tribal God. You know, like we talk about you know, the natives in Africa, when you take Christianity and merge it with another God, you have something that's not of God. And so the people that I've mentioned, R.L. Dabney, Rusas Rushduni, uh, I, didn't, I don't know if I mentioned uh, Criswell, there have been some ministers who got the gospel content right, but when it came to the application of your, your fellow man, got it wrong. And in some cases, and there are good cases like Criswell, who I mentioned, who later in life, he repented. He says, oh, I was blind about this. And, and that's where we can have hope because God who worked on our hearts is working on hearts of people, including Jonah. Because Jonah didn't want to go. He's like, I, God, you're going to show compassion to these people. I don't want, he, he literally, that's why he ran because he knew that the same God that loved Israel, that was faithful and compassionate and long suffering, loving God. I don't want that God to go to those folks. And you fill in the blank wherever those folks are. You know, uh, in my case, in my sin, it was to white folks. Somebody, it might be folks from Mexico and El Salvador or from the Middle East or towards Asian people or from China. And so a part of discipleship wherever you are and i hope you're part of a good christian church fellowship is we hear the truth and let the shepherd walk us away from bad things 
including bad ideas about people. And so just make no mistake, Charles is a work in progress. <laughs> and I'm grateful for people in my life, such as y'all and such as Brother Art. And, and, but uh, you, without Jesus, you would not want to be around me. Those are facts. <laughs> All right. I love you. I hope that helps. I Thank love you. that, Charles. Thanks so much. And um, I want to tell everyone that the next time we meet will be on February 25th. We're doing it every other week. Um, and so because of that, and uh, the chapters are short, we're hitting two chapters. Um, in chapter one, you're going to look at the heart of God from the very beginning of Genesis. Um, and Charles is going to share with us what that is. And then we're going to dive into Noah, right? Chapter two. There's a passage of scripture that I want to read. And then maybe Charles, if you don't mind praying us out tonight. But um, we who are, are bearers of the God who made us, we who house the, the Holy Spirit that um, gives life to every one of us and drives us for unity as children of God, we are with, without excuse to be catalysts of love and unity in this world. And uh, I wanted to read, there's, a, there's this awesome passage in Ephesians chapter two. Ephesians is written by the apostle Paul. And um, he is talking about the purpose of Jesus. What is it that Jesus actually came to do? And um, in Ephesians chapter two, uh, he talks about this one poignant place that Jesus came to remove walls of hostility. So I'm just gonna read to you a few verses and then um, Charles will pray us out. But Listen to this from Ephesians chapter two for all of us that are believers in Jesus. For he, Jesus himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. Amen to that. You go, Amen. Charles. Amen. 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 Let's pray together. Wow, what a great, great, great um, word to hear about the great unifying work that you did, Jesus Christ, at the cross. Thank you for breaking down the barriers that separated us from one another and separated us from the Father. Thank you that we can look to the cross and see that you did for us something there that we could have never done for ourselves, And when you cried out, it is finished. The work echoes into eternity. So we thank you. We love you. Flood our hearts with your love so that it overflows on everybody we meet and everybody we know. And when we fall short, please forgive us of our sins and help us to live and love like you until you come. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you all. This has been really fantastic. Amen. Amen. Until then, we'll see you February 25th at 7 p.m. on Thursday night. God bless you all. And thank you for being in this journey. And Charles, thank you, sir, for being so generous with your time, your heart, and especially your humble wisdom. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you, brother. God bless y'all. Thank, thank you. you comments. See, thank see you. you. Next time. Looking forward to it next time. Bye. 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 Thank you both. Thank you both for your uh, efforts in the world. Thank you, Art. Good night, y'all. Good night.